ho, ho. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season we select a theme and then we hand pick six movies all related to that theme. And then on each episode of the podcast, we take one of those movies and give you some history on the people in front of and behind the camera to understand how and why each of these movies was ever made. And this is the start of season 18. There's pumpkin spice in the air, and there's plastic jack-o'-lanterns on store shelves, and it's next to Guy Fieri brand turkey baster blasters and all manner of Christmas decorations for sale across three aisles as false flag operations to disprove the never-ending war on Christmas. Hi, I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we are happy to bring you this season's theme, Christmas Time is Here featuring half a dozen movies that aren't Christmas movies per se, they're more Christmas adjacent. They have a whiff of Christmas on them, a dash, a sousant of the holiday spirit tossed in for seasoning, but they are not what you would call Christmas movies, not in the traditional sense. For example, when you think about gingerbread men, what comes to mind? Grandmas or decorating cookies or a cup of hot cocoa with a peppermint stick to stir it? I'll tell you what you don't think about is Gary Busey's crazy soul insanely inhabiting a two-foot-tall pastry-shaped man in a bakery killing people. But that's what you get for this season's opening film, The Ginger Dead Man. I literally have no idea what Bo has whipped up in his kitchen of fun facts for this episode's opener. So let's gather around the fireplace and get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to tell us a story from long, long ago as visions of sugar plums dance in our heads. Bo, get in here and spread some holiday cheer for these people. If you're listening to this episode close to the time it first airs, you are in that glorious moment before Halloween. The leaves are turning on the trees, there's a crisp chill in the air, and the streaming services and television networks are filled with horror movies. That's my kind of holiday. And when I think of the horror movie season, I think of rows of shelves, empty boxes with art on the covers that promised far more than the cheapo movies they advertised could deliver. I remember walking those rows, looking for movies as yet unseen, or favorites begging for another viewing. It was the physical version of scrolling through the endless offerings on Netflix or Amazon Prime, looking at the box art and turning it over to read descriptions of celluloid nightmares. And it's strange to think that it simply doesn't exist anymore. Like Pet Rocks or Bill Clinton for President coffee mugs, these are artifacts of the past never to return. You can still find VHS tapes at Goodwill stores or yard sales, And some of the more obscure films that never found their way to DVD or digital streaming can fetch a high price. How much, you ask? A good copy of Journey into the Beyond or The Legend of Hillbilly John can get you more than $1,000. And it all started in the 1970s when the VCR was born. These video cassette recorders were luxury items, and the tapes they played were pricey too, skewing towards three figures for a single VHS tape. Not the kind of thing your average consumer was buying. Movie studios charged a premium because they were afraid that if you could watch a movie at home, you'd never go to the theaters. Not at all like the concerns that streaming movies at home will cause the death of movie theaters. That's crazy talk. And about 10 years after the advent of VCR technology, prices on these tapes dropped. And soon any poor schlub off the street could buy a bunch of them and then turn around and rent them to some other poor slubs who had VCRs but no movies to play on them. And thus, the video rental store was born. Mom and pop places shared the stage with big chains like Blockbuster and Hollywood Video. By 1988, there were about 25,000 of these stores. And that doesn't count another 45,000 or so that weren't dedicated to video rentals but still managed to find a corner of their retail spaces to do a little renting of their own. Even your neighborhood grocery store was likely to have a few shelves of new releases to tempt you with the promise of Star Trek III The Search for Spock or Remo Williams The Adventure Begins while you were buying that 12-pack of PBR on a Friday night. With home video becoming a lucrative business for movie companies too, they invested in new technologies like DVD, And soon the VHS boxes were replaced by DVD cases, and then Blu-ray cases, and then no cases at all. 
cable companies and movie studios, as well as movie-by-mail titan Netflix, discovered that the best way to deliver movies to a bunch of numbskulls who just want to sit their fat asses on the couch and watch a movie was to let them pick those movies right on their sofas. No store required. And video rental stores went the way of buggy whip manufacturers. As a wise man once pointed out, the quickest way to go bankrupt is to get an increasing share of a shrinking market. And nothing shrank quite like home video rentals. But I still miss wandering those aisles, looking for obscure movies and art house gems to expand my cinematic palette. And as frequent listeners of this show will know, I have a soft spot for independent filmmakers of that era. There's something admirable and more than a little romantic about the notion of a creator who exists outside the mainstream, making his own kind of art in the way he or she is most able. As far as cinematic empires that live in this world adjacent to Hollywood, perhaps there is no greater success than Charles Band. John Carpenter, an undisputed master of horror, once said of Charles Band, the director of this episode's film, The Ginger Dead Man, quote, When the atomic bomb goes off, all that will be left will be cockroaches, and I think the other survivor will be Charlie Band. Whether that is a compliment, I will leave up to you, gentle listener, but to understand why the Ginger Dead Man exists, you have to understand Charles Band. And to understand that, let's start at the beginning. Charlie is the son of Albert Ban, who started off working for famed director John Huston, and Albert did a little bit of everything. He started off editing movies, then wrote a few, including the big screen adaptation of The Red Badge of Courage. He produced some more movies and even directed a few. The work led Albert Band all over the world, and he spent a lot of time in Italy making movies where Charlie and his brother Richard grew up. Charles ensured his family was working, too, with Brother Richard composing scores to many of Charles Band's movies, and Father Albert would direct some films that Charles produced. Nepotism, am I right? Having grown up in the world of movies, it was only natural that Charles would find his way into movie making. In 1973, Charlie directed his first movie, a softcore sex parody film called Last Foxtrot in Burbank. The movie is lost to time now, but this was the film where John Carpenter served as editor. In addition to directing, Charles Band was eager to try his hand at producing, which led to a nudity-driven adaptation of Cinderella and the movie made famous by Mystery Science Theater 3000, a film called Laser Blast, an obvious Star Wars ripoff. In these productions, Charlie would display an eye for stretching a budget and for using stop motion and miniatures to add some production value to his bare-bones budgets. In 1983, Charlie had his biggest budget with a 3D sci-fi epic called Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin. Produced by Universal, it had all the makings of a success, but in a summer ruled by Risky Business and Return of the Jedi, Metal Storm fizzled. With a failure at a major studio haunting him, Charlie could have floundered in the studio system or given up on movies altogether. But Charlie had other ideas. He formed his own studio, Empire Pictures, in 1983. His plan was a simple one. Use his talent for making a small budget look better than the numbers on the ledger and dominate the low-budget marketplace. Empire Pictures produced some genuinely great movies, from the quirky Terminator-inspired movie Trancers, in which comedian Tim Thomerson played a detective from the future named Jack Death, to the Stuart Gordon-directed movies Reanimator, From Beyond, and Dolls. He produced Ghoulies and Troll and Terror Vision, and if you're a horror movie fan, you've seen at least a few of those. There were more hits than misses during this time, with the home video boom of the 1980s fueling the successes of several of his producing efforts and Band's decision to produce and distribute these movies himself meant he turned a buck on every stage of the film's life cycle. Flush with success, Band bought a castle in his childhood home of Italy where he could set up studio headquarters and use the castle itself as a set. Always looking for a way to make his money work for him, this guy. He vowed to friends and co-workers that he would make 200 movies by the year 2000. And then the bottom fell out of it. Empire Pictures started losing money, and with a stench of failure around the name, Empire Pictures was shuttered, and Full Moon Pictures was born. 
Full Moon partnered with Paramount Home Video for distribution with the goal of making features intended for home viewing, but with a whiff of that big screen feel to them. Charles Band also wanted to make his own universe, inspired by the Marvel comics he'd adored when he was a child. He envisioned series of movies with crossovers between them, characters that would cross-pollinate between franchises. And with that goal in mind, Charles Band began with Puppet Master, which would begin the Full Moon Cinematic Universe, or FMCU, a thing that I just made up while I was working on this introduction. The trick, Band believed, was to build a fan base around these movies, with event films and regular releases, and at Full Moon's Prime, they were releasing about a movie a month. And Puppet Master was a great start, with some pretty good stop-motion effects and veteran horror director David Schmeller at the helm. Schmeller would later complain that Band didn't pay him what he was due and wasn't invited on commentary tracks for the film due to Charles Band's reluctance to give anyone credit besides himself. Charlie Band brought Trancers over with more Tim Thomerson and Helen Hunt action, and that produced five more movies in the series. Dollman also employed Tim Thomerson as a miniature hero in the role of the titular character, and Dollman would square off against other characters from the Full Moon universe when he met the Demonic Toys. My personal favorite series came from director Ted Nicolau, who made a series of gory vampire films called Subspecies, and there are four of those at present, with another on the way sometime in the next year or so. I know, I know, some people count Vampire Diaries, but eh, that's just a side project. There was a reunion with Stuart Gordon for an adaptation of The Pit and the Pendulum, and Jeffrey Combs, from previous episode Faust, Love of the Damned, <laughs> showed up as a Doctor Strange-inspired hero called Doctor Mordred, enabling Band to live out his fantasy of making a comic book movie. Also borrowing from comics was Video Zone, a preview of other Full Moon features coming soon inspired by the Stan Soapbox features at the end of Marvel Comics, where creator Stan Lee would answer questions and tease upcoming releases. Band himself would preview upcoming films and take viewers behind the scenes of other Full Moon productions. With Full Moon in full gear, Charles Band added to his cinematic portfolio with a spin-off studio called Moonbeam, aimed at the kids' home video market. It's here the band created Prehysteria about tiny dinosaurs, carrying over his weird fascination with tiny things on film. Dollman, Demonic Toys, Puppet Master, Prehysteria, all featuring little versions of things romping around. But who am I to yuck Charles Band's yum, you know? Along with Moonbeam came Surrender Cinema, which specialized in softcore porn movies, and Cult Video, which released old European movies of questionable quality. Whatever Band thought might turn a few bucks, he would invent a new label to distribute these movies if he had to. Full Moon movies were a video store staple. Katie Rife from the AV Club said of the films, quote, You can't really separate the Full Moon sensibility from that of Charles Band. The childlike enthusiasm he showed in those videos translates into the films, which all have this bargain basement version of Spielbergian wonder mixed with R-rated violence and nudity, perfect for 12-year-olds. There were t-shirts and comic book adaptations and all kinds of merch, and it all looked like Full Moon was destined for greatness. But then Paramount turned over some of its top brass, who were less amenable to distributing these schlocky B-movies. There was also suspicion from Paramount that maybe the money they were spending to produce some of these movies were finding its way into Band's pocket and not into the production budgets. With finances stretched thin because of their aggressive production schedule and the distribution channels for these movies suddenly turning from river to trickle, Full Moon Pictures ran into some serious financial problems. Budgets got smaller and then came Netflix and the fall of video stores when lurid covers couldn't generate rentals because there was no foot traffic in stores because there were no stores. It looked like the end of Charles Band and his pirate ship of filmmakers and miniature monsters had run aground. But in the mid-2000s, Band made a Hail Mary pass in the form of a baked monster, fun-sized of course, called the Ginger Dead Man. He nabbed Gary Busey to star, 
purportedly offering $25,000 to Busey, a figure he expected Gary Busey to turn down and was surprised when the award-winning actor and noted weirdo accepted. Shortly after, Band produced a companion film called Evil Bong about, you guessed it, an evil bong. The two films were meant to launch two new series of movies and Band hit the road with an event called The Full Moon Roadshow, showing off the new movies and pitching directly to fans at horror conventions all over the United States. And it worked. The Ginger Dead Man and Evil Bong brought in some much needed money. And it didn't hurt that the brand got some legitimacy when a director and writer named S. Craig Zoller, who had made the vicious and very good Bone Tomahawk with Kurt Russell and Patrick Wilson, decided to try his hand at a Puppet Master movie. While it wasn't produced by Band or Full Moon, it's hard to separate Puppet Master from the Full Moon Library, and the movie raised the low-budget studio's profile. Since then, there have been several Ginger Dead Man and Evil Bong movies and naturally a crossover between the two. Full Moon has since launched its own streaming service, available as an Amazon Prime channel, and Band has stated that the subscriber base continues to grow, which funds the next round of Full Moon films. At the very least, Band is optimistic that he can continue to do what he always does, make schlocky movies on a budget and hope that the fans turn out. But what about this movie before us, this phoenix of schlock? The movie that may just have saved Full Moon Pictures from being snubbed out forever. How bad it could it possibly be coming from the director of Trancers? To answer that, we're going to need an expert, and there is no better expert on bad movies than one Chad S. Cooper. So let's get him in here. Ladies and gentlemen, ginger dead men and ginger dead women, it's 2005's The Ginger Dead Man. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to season 18, if you can believe that nonsense, of Pick 6 Movies. I am one of your hosts, Bo. With me as ever is the uh, the fresh-smelling and doughboy-soft Chad Cooper. <laughs> and uh, yeah, th this season we're calling Christmas Time is Here because we're talking about movies that are Christmas-adjacent. Movies that are set in and around Christmas but are not perhaps Christmas movies per se. Exactly. It's sort of the holiday season. They're sort of Christmas stuff and sort of christmas things but not a lot of christmas stuff really it's a christmas movie but not really is that an actual christmas song it is now trademark copyright you steal that shit and you put it on youtube i'm gonna come after you you know every time uh somebody starts playing christmas music and it is pre say december 23rd uh-huh then i just have to set fire to something Oh it's just Lord. a knee-jerk reaction. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. Like, I've tried, and uh, it's honestly the reason we have no malls in this town anymore. Now, the movie that we're featuring on this episode, The Ginger Dead Man, strangely enough, Bo, isn't set at Christmas, which, how did that happen? How does the bakery, which is the centerpiece of this particular film, doesn't have Christmas lights hanging up, a couple of stockings or something? It, it's a huge mess. There is a gingerbread man, which is generally uh, Christmas associated. Of course it is. That's all it's associated with. Either that or Shrek making dick jokes or donkeys having sex with dragon jokes. Go on. <laughs> yeah, the thing that I find interesting about about this movie is that <laughs> go on it was made for as little money as you could possibly spend to get it out i thought you were gonna say that it was made with coupons probably so well you know hollywood coupons <laughs> the barter is, system yeah and like I, i'm pretty sure that gary Busey was just paid in jack daniels as is his writer it stars a bunch of 
actors who have been in other things but are probably you know you could get them all like the baker's dozen of the cast for about 20 grand again when you say things i was thinking i saw one in an automobile i saw one eating in a diner the most storied of the cast members i think aside from gary Busey himself is the guy who plays jimmy dean oh yeah that and guy he's been in everything all kinds of television shows has done all this voice work for video games like you and i have both played games and seen shows that he is in prior to mm -hmm. this performance his name is larry cedar mm -hmm. and he's been around forever he actually played the creature that was on the wing of the plane in that twilight zone movie remake you want to see something really stupid keep your pants on which by the way far and away let's just get this out of the way if you're gonna watch twilight zone the movie first of all you shouldn't because it's not that good but if you do <laughs> you just fast forward all the way to the john lithgow segment that george miller directed because that's the only one worth a shit really yeah all right if you say so i haven't seen that movie in forever it's not very good the steven spielberg one is really dull the one that vic morrow famously died in right is so chopped up that it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense by the end of it because they didn't want to show the scenes you know where a man and child were brutally murdered by a helicopter the joe dante one ends really badly like it's probably the best of a bad bunch and then it's like george miller rolls in at the the end of it to be like all right you dickheads here's how you do this and then does a segment that's genuinely fantastic that movie is 25 percent good which is a failing grade by any measurement before vic morrow died in that movie he helped to make jennifer jason lee he's her daddy yeah you know if we want to continue not talking about the ginger dead man i can tell you about <laughs> i'm, I'm re totally okay <laughs> rewatching the hitcher with a 24 year old jennifer jason lee in it and that movie is about a million times better than this one <laughs> So let's talk about The Ginger Dead Man. First off, this if isn't a movie, Bo. Not really. Because the runtime listed for this thing is one hour, ten minutes. But the last ten minutes of this are credits, and there are almost four minutes of credits at the beginning, which makes this piece of entertainment around 54 minutes long. This is the Full Moon Studios way of doing business, which is just getting by, Chad. Just squeaking in under the wire. Like, as a production company, uh -huh. Full Moon Studios uh -huh. is like the student that the teacher knows has something on the ball, right. but just is not applying themselves whatsoever. Are you sure? Yes. Charles Band, capable of making good movies, which he did earlier in his career, mm -hmm. and then at a certain point was just like, do I want to make good movies or do I want to make money? This movie doesn't do either. Yes, it does, Chad. It made money? There is an entire streaming service dedicated to these movies. Ginger Dead Man resurrected Full Moon Studios. What the hell is wrong with people? <laughs> <laughs> well that's a different subject but yeah this movie made money because it cost nothing to make coupons coupons and <laughs> like licensed out to a bunch of streaming services and that's where all the money is we're in the wrong business man i mean if you have no soul we are sure i haven't seen my reflection in years yeah. <laughs> sliding doors don't open at the quickie mark for you anymore <laughs> i brush my teeth and it's just a brush moving around <laughs> Yeah, it's a, more of a Memoirs of an Invisible Man kind of scenario. It's a long backstory. Yeah. Sam Neill, hot on your heels. Let's talk about the Ginger Dead Man. Oh, sure. <laughs> this won't take long. No, it's only 54 minutes. Audience, don't go out for chips or nothing, because you'll miss the whole thing. <laughs> this movie starts off, and we're at the world-famous Cadillac Jack Cafe and Pink Motel, which is a movie set where you would film something set in the 50s or the 60s, or if you wanted to do some modern-day retro atmospheric whatever it is you're trying to accomplish and you may remember cadillac jacks from such films as drive and grease 2 and 976 evil 2 and bo it was featured in an episode of the incredible hulk tv show from 1978 titled my favorite magician where david banner is fired from a dishwashing job thanks to an eccentric old magician jasper the great who promptly takes on david banner as his new assistant and i'm guessing the hulk shows up at the bottom of the hour for a little bit of action and then he shows back up at 10 minutes till the show's end to save the day and ray walston played the magician because he was the martian 
Martian on My Favorite Martian. That's why the episode was called My Favorite Magician. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> uh, if you had asked me who the magician was, uh -huh. I would have gone either Ray Walston or Dick Van Patten. Okay. The title alone. I need to go watch that episode because as a footnote to that, Scatman Crothers makes a cameo. He was the voice of Hong Kong Fooey. That also sounds better than the Ginger Dead Man. <laughs> Let's get back to Cadillac Jacks. So this hotel is clearly set in Southern California. There are palm trees in the shot, the pink colors of the building. Our movie is going to be set in the greater Los Angeles area, but it's actually not, Bo. We're going to head to Texas pretty soon. In Waco is where this is theoretically set set but somewhere yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in lethal weapon 2 style chad we don't waste no time yeah we leap right into the well, i mean we got 54 minutes we're not <laughs> This is an episode of Game of Thrones. Wait, which is amazing because they bullshit so much in this movie. There are scenes where people just start sharing their feelings and stuff for a good two, three minutes. Yeah, we'll get to that. There, <laughs> oh, some clumsy dialogue at best. Uh, but so Gary Busey, aka Millard Findelmeyer, is the character's name in the movie. But we don't need to worry about that. He is holding uh, everyone at this place hostage, and by everyone, I mean the four people that we paid to be in this movie he and it's a diner that they're in and he shoots what is either a woman or a man who screams like a woman and then the camera pans back and we see that he has shot the waitress who is now slumped over on the counter with a hole in her head well she actually has two holes there's one in the front and one in the back that's usually how the math of a gunshot works yeah and then we have a guy playing hero chad which is never a good idea they tell you all the time in those training videos like hey uh -huh. if you get held up you just do whatever the, the guy says right but this asshole is like hey listen you need to put down the gun buddy it's this old man and he says this ain't right we gotta fight back and he, he screams out, you bastard, I'm going to fucking kill you. Right, like it's Flight 93. Dude, he runs with a switchblade that we see him pop out to kill Gary Busey. And I'm like, dude, this movie is off to a good start, Bo. I got <laughs> an old man with a switchblade rushing Busey who has a gun, who's already killed a waitress. It's looking up. Yeah, well, don't get used to this. Busey shoots him, kills dad. <laughs> Thunk. And then Gary Busey just starts monologuing, and I don't really think any of this was actually in the script. Yeah, I don't think there was a script, Bo. He says, I can smell something in the air. It's definitely feminine. Feminine stands for fear erodes my innate natural instincts, notifying eternality. <laughs> yeah feminine and then the brother of our main character but the son of the dad who just got shot if you uh -huh. follow that logic he stands up apparently he took the training at the local popeye's chicken where he works because he's like hey i'm unarmed you shot my dad look at my palms they're free of any weapons just take the money and get out of here how about you put the gun down sir and Busey really plays acting coach on this he's i'm just not believing this i need you to say it again Tell me to put the gun down. Look at here, Dawson's Creek. I'm the star of this movie, okay? You've really got to up your game if you were going to be on screen with me. Speaking of which, I'm not going to be on screen for a while now. Because the movie has this wide shot where you see a forearm holding a gun at this teenager. And it's not Gary Busey's arm holding this gun. No. Because you get this edited audio of Gary Busey talking to this kid. And it sounds like they're running all of Busey's dialogue off one of those prank call soundboards. It's just full of non sequiturs that almost sound legit to the responses of what this brother says and because the brother's like huh just put down the gun yeah you probably think that's a good idea seriously <laughs> put it down how about me what who is your daddy and what does he do for a living mister put down the gun get to the chopper the gun sir please let put it down and let my sister who kind of looks like nev campbell go and my favorite is when he says no 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 that sounds too much like my high school principal try it again uh uh put down the gun no no that sounds more like a majorette try it one more time put down the gun no no do it again and mean it i want you to say it from your testicles bring that sound from your <laughs> testicles up to your throat and then tell me to put down the gun uh put down the gun all right that's better 
And then he puts the gun on the counter. Hey, look, sorry about your dad or whoever, your uncle, maybe your brother. I don't know how generations work, but welcome to planet Earth. Shit happens, okay? Earth stands for evolving and rotating towards heaven. Think about that one, son. All right, my gun is on the counter. If you want to grab it, you can be a big hero or you can be a sissy boy. And then Busey reveals to us, the audience, that he has a large pocket knife in his hands and he opens the blade. And as the brother lunges for the gun, completely ignoring the safety video from Popeye's Chicken where he works on the weekends, Busey just starts stabbing this kid in the back repeatedly. Yeah. And once this kid is dead. Mm -hmm. Three down, one to go. Busey says... Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Oh, my God. Here, kitty. But then he starts coaching himself on acting. Because at one point, he goes real falsetto. He's like, here, kitty. No, that's not right. Here, kitty, here, kitty, 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 kitty. That's the keeper. That's good. All right, action, everybody. Hey, how about I do it one time like Max Headroom? Here, 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 kitty. How about that? That's pretty cool. How about that? Hold on. Kitty Sue. Kitty. Y'all. Nope. All right. Well, uh, shit. I can even give you one of them. Uh-ohs. What do you think about that? And so as he's approaching this girl, he's like, look, I ain't going to kill you, but I got to do what my mama always told me, which was to finish what I started. <laughs> now, that's what my mama told me. Now, my mama ain't in this movie per se, but she's kind of in it. You will get to that in a minute. He starts kind of like talking in his head. Like, like Norman Bates style. Mom, stop it. Piss on the Yankees. Piss on the Indian. And then fires. Yeah, but he doesn't shoot the girl. And then we immediately have the cops show up, not because we see them, but because we hear sirens in the background. They're not paying extra actors to be law enforcement officials, Bo. No, and Gary Busey, not the character, mind you, no. hears these sirens is like, I gotta go, and then just takes off. No, Bo, his exact words are, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was a legitimate Gary Busey reaction. Oh, look, Charles, I need to I need to get out of here, man. Me and the cops don't get along ever since my little Gary, glug, glug, Gary, vroom, Gary, vroom, thump, thump. Gary, they're, yeah. they're just sound effects. They're not real police officers, Gary. Says you. Gary, look out the window. You can't see anyone. There's no one here, Gary. They're not police officers. Tell you what, you talk to my ass, because that's going to be what's pointed at you on my way out the back door. And I swear to God, Charles, if cops show up at my door, I'm going to know who sent them there, and I will fucking kill you. Gary, no cops are going to show up. Look, I hate to call rank, but we've paid for you to be on set for 97 minutes, and you've been here exactly 48. We need you to record some bullshit dialogue for this little gingerbread man or whatever the hell this movie's going to be about. You can't just- Gary! I'll call you on my cell phone oh, shit. as soon as I get a cell phone. All right, everyone, everyone, gather around. Can anyone here do a terrible Gary Busey accent? Uh, I can do Tim Roth. Close enough. You're hired. We cut to <laughs> credits, which are, I would argue, papyrus adjacent in terms of being shitty fonts. It's yes. almost, a, it's not papyrus, but it looks vaguely like egyptian slash holiday-ish yes yeah it has a little bit of like dumbed down old english serif font again it is mind-boggling how this isn't set at christmas you just don't some lights jackass and over the credits there's shots in the background of the tools of baking chad measuring cups and whatnot man they list everybody in these opening credits like a movie from the 1940s Remember when all the credits were up front and it was like 22 people? Like, they're listing the, you know, transportation provided by DNR's limo service. Like, why is that up front? I like the fact that at least 30% of the people in this movie sound like they were previously members of a goth band. Like, you got <laughs> Danny Draven, Elvis Strange, some dude named Casper. This is a very 90s movie. It feels like the 90s. Like, the haircuts, the clothes, the dog. Doc Martens. There's a lot of wispy bangs on the women. Yeah, there's a lot of Jennifer Aniston hair energy going on in this a movie. A lot of that. Well, th the biggest missing factor besides Christmas is that there's no 90s era music. It's all shitty synthesized keyboard that they paid somebody in another country to record for pennies oh yes if it was not cold from just a like free license site or something yeah. uh, you know you just do a search for ambient electronic music yeah like, da -da 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 -da. 
It, oh, it's so do, bad. Do, 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 do. Bum, bum, bum. You steal that shit from us, put it on YouTube, I'm coming after you. Look, we've proven with the last episode that we did <laughs> that we can make our own music. So after our opening credits, we find ourselves in Somewheresville, Texas at night, which is where the rest of our movie is going to take place over maybe three or four hours, not of movie time, of pretend story time. And outside we or we're on this small sleepy town city street and we see a building and there's a sign that's very poorly lit that says Betty's Bakery. Mm -hmm. And inside Betty's Bakery, we see not Nev Campbell, and she is the girl from the previous scene who did not get shot by Gary Busey. And here, she's wearing an apron, and she's walking around the back of the bakery where she finds an empty bottle of Jack Daniels or George Dickel. It's definitely <laughs> Black Label Whiskey, <laughs> and I'm so excited, Bo, because we got a drunk in our movie a secret drunk or at least a drunk that likes to hide bottles like in the tank of the, <laughs> the toilet and whatnot which is always a good sign that means it's going to be a very special episode of the ginger dead man do you drink alone does the lord count as a person <laughs> exactly <laughs> but who's the greatest drunk from movies of all time from movies yes from movies read the drunk from back to the future greatest drunk from tv uh otis the drunk Yes, from the Andy Griffith Show. He's yeah. our leader. Greatest drunk from literature. From literature. Charles Dickens. Sidney Carton. Close enough. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From uh, Tale of Two Cities. Tale of Two Cities. Yeah, it's a yeah. far, far better thing that I do than I've ever done. It's a far, far better rest I go to than I've ever known. Brings a tear to your eye. I, I mean, I suppose if you're a 19th century <laughs> dandy. I would say the greatest film drunk this is a, a a dark horse i understand that but it's murray from the ref yes <laughs> because there's a great moment where gus as played by dennis leary calls a bar and asks hey is there a fucking waste of flesh named murray there and when the bartender says is there a fucking waste of flesh named murray here murray's response is gussie <laughs> A moment of recognition that only his friend would call. I mean, he is so, so gripped by alcoholism <laughs> that even, even his closest friend calls him a waste of flesh. If I have to recommend two Christmas movies every season, The Ref and Arthur Christmas. Those are my go-tos. Those are my staples. I'm a Scrooge man myself, but I get it. Yeah. Uh, so in addition to finding this empty bottle of booze, which was more interesting than the movie as a whole. Not Nev Campbell goes over to her vision board <laughs> where she has photos of her dead brother and her dead father. And not Nev Campbell says, happy birthday, big brother. Looks like we won't be driving to Dallas to celebrate the big 21 after all. But wherever you are up there, I hope they have strippers and Lone Star. You know, this was the point where I was was like you know that sounds like we lost a cure for cancer uh at the old <laughs> the old diner something tells me that her brother wasn't going to be the next mother Teresa or anything and but uh, also on her vision board chad right beside her beloved pictures of her father uh -huh. and brother sure are newspaper articles hastily ripped out newspaper articles yeah probably by betty the drunk given the tattered look of them that say like <laughs> by the way gary Busey is about to be executed yeah and there's pictures of Busey. yeah and it's a couple of surprise shots which i think the production crew just snuck up behind him as he was getting in the cab to leave the set like gary oh shit man what are you doing i'm pretty sure they told him in advance he just forgot in between <laughs> gary we're about to take your picture and click the idea that someone was about to take his picture just flew out of his head we get a little voiceover work from gary Busey as she's looking at these newspaper clippings and we hear i'll get you for this even if it's beyond the grave because my mama's rich in coonsboro you're finished and i was like i don't understand any of those words i looked up coonsboro and surprise surprise Bo, that's not a real place <laughs> that is a surprise coming out of gary Busey, you would think he would be like your source of good information in right. fact, I follow Gary Busey on Twitter just so I know how to respond to the COVID crisis. At this point in the movie, we don't know if Gary Busey is dead. Why is his voice 
rattling around in not Nev Campbell's skull like this. I don't know. And I don't know if it's her thinking this or if Gary Busey is telling us, the audience, like, don't worry. I know this is kind of boring right now. Right. But I'm coming back. Don't even worry about it. And when I come back, it's going to be weird. There's a knock at the door and not Nev Campbell goes over and she opens it and she finds this box of grandma's gingerbread seasoning cut to what appears to be daytime in the alleyway where we see a shadowy figure in a black cloak disappear around the corner. Now, Bo, I've seen this movie twice and this person's appearance is not explained. The implication is that this is his mother. But that's only if you kind of squint when you're thinking about the movie. And yeah. like, who could that possibly have been? And it's in the voiceover immediately prior to it's him being like, my mother knows all kinds of voodoo and shit. But why have the shot of the person in the cloak? Just have the knock. She opens the door. There's a box. Look around. Don't show the alleyway, which is clearly shot at noon when the rest of the movie is shot at midnight. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a fine question, Chad, but the answer to all of these is going to be because it was probably cheaper yeah or nobody cared not nev campbell is now joined by not freddie prince jr another worker in the bakery and not freddie prince jr comes over and says oh yeah i got tickets to wrestle palooza they let amateurs wrestle in the ring this is my shot at the big time in this corner the butcher baker that's gonna be me oh yeah after a couple of seconds of this he realizes that not nev campbell isn't into his shit at all uh -huh. and he goes oh no i think you're still upset about your brother and she says yeah that's great now why don't you open up this gingerbread seasoning and we're gonna try it out and you know today would have been my brother's 21st birthday we would have been at a titty bar and he'd have been getting drunk <sighs> i miss him so much and then as not freddie prince jr opens up the box of seasoning with a knife he cuts himself bad enough that when he squeezes his fingers into his fist blood just gushes out of his palm into the open box of gingerbread spices Oh, no, that's going to require a tetanus shot. The Kool-Aid man shows up and says, Oh, yeah, you stole my catchphrase. I'm taking <laughs> you to court. Not Nev Campbell says, You want I should take you down to get some stitches? And Not Freddie Prince Jr. says, Oh, yeah, I mean, no, no, I'm the butcher baker. I can take the heat. This guy's 100% avoiding the COVID vaccine. Well, I think everybody in this movie is. I mean, it's Waco, <laughs> Texas, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of when you think of Waco, Texas? David Koresh, of course. I think of David Koresh, Dr. Pepper, then Steve Martin. In that order. I only think of David Koresh because, as I've often said, I've been trying to start a cult for years now. Mm -hmm. And you try to learn at the feet of the masters, Chad. You know, speaking of Kool-Aid and the uh -huh. Kool-Aid man, uh -huh. I'm always puzzled when people that I work with use the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid because they use it inappropriately. They use it in a way that implies just blind obedience, absent the cult part where everyone dies. Like, if we can just get all of our customers to drink the Kool-Aid, it'll be great. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? No. <laughs> yeah, that's horrifying. Also, it was Flavor-Aid. <laughs> just, you know, I know it doesn't matter. I know Kool-Aid was popularized, but it was Flavor-Aid. They the get way. it all wrong, jackasses. Yeah. Just like this movie, Flavor-Aid. He couldn't even afford Kool-Aid. How much are those packets? They're 10 cents a piece. Is there anything cheaper? These are seven. Get those. If you really want to send shivers down your spine, uh -huh. realize that all of the people in Jonestown died for less than $5 worth of flavor aid. What's even worse, he didn't have the decency to add goddamn sugar. It was unsweetened. It was, you know, they were like, oh, God, this is awful. I would really be upset if I weren't vomiting up my intestines right now. Is this what it tastes like without sugar? Yeah, it is. Just drink it. I mean, it really burns going down. I know it needs the sugar. Hey, do you want the shot of it? Because we'll give you the shot. No, no, I'll drink it. The baby first, you said? Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So we introduce a new character in this movie, uh, not Rosie Perez. Uh, all right. She's up in the front of the bake, right? Because it's closed because it's uh -huh. nighttime. Uh-huh. She's reading this newspaper and she yells out, oh my God, Billy, they executed Gary Busey two days ago. The guy who killed your father and your brother. And then not Nev Campbell runs up. It was like, that kind of seems like something they should have told me about, right? That the guy who killed my father and brother was going to be executed. 
I know, it's crazy, right? Bureaucracy! Two years ago, that loco bendejo, now he's finally dead. Another soul for El Diablo. That is actual dialogue from this movie with that accent, which the actress loses in mm-hmm. subsequent scenes. I also like how she details, so after the execution, Gary Busey was cremated and his ashes were sent to his mother, who is a witch, who makes the ashes with some gingerbread spice? She doesn't say that. She <laughs> says they sent it to her in Coonsboro, which is not a real city. She didn't say she's a witch and gingerbreads. You're making that up, Bo. I saw this movie twice. But that's what happens. She says they electrocuted him or something. Then they they cremated him. And then they sent the ashes to his mother two days ago. Also, in other horrifying real world news, the ashes of a person that you're given after cremation Uh isn't actually the ashes of a person. It is their remaining bones pounded into dust. You know, just if you ever wondered. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. (laughs) So, listeners, what Mm -hmm. what you can take away from this episode is Jonestown uh, all died from flavor aid and not gay raid not kool-aid yeah not not kool-aid and that the ashes that you get after cremation aren't ashes at all it's uh ground up bones so right. there you go and steve martin was born in waco texas Mm-hmm. He also did magic at Disneyland. Not Freddie Prince Jr. He's nursing his open hand gash and looking in the mirror, practicing his wrestling smack. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then on the other side of the room in this bakery, there is some dough that's being mixed in a small size professional mixer. So not Freddie Prince Jr. walks over and he adds to the dough a scoop of the gingerbread mix that he not five minutes ago openly and profusely bled into to ask him why would be a HIPAA violation he walks away and then we get a close-up of the dough and we hear what the subtitles called a whispering diabolical voice it's more chanting i think <laughs> the night time is the night time <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here huh whatever nonsense that you have to do to get to a ginger dead man is what's happening so this murdering spirit is gonna inhabit the ginger dead man and that's coming from the ashes of a bone smashed gary Busey. the that's movie right. never explains any of this Bo. you know that's clever uh writing chad because it's all about you being dropped into the situation with Figure the characters it out. yeah what's going on what do you think's happening the <laughs> guys in the dough yeah that's what's happening you got uh-huh. it look at this small guy shit the people behind child's play had the decency to explain that the murderer in that film had his soul put into a doll by means of haitian voodoo you know to a lesser extent west craven's shocker in that movie the killer made a deal with the devil so he becomes electricity and he does not stick one in the stink and two in the pink or whatever as i was informed that that would happen in the movie it doesn't going back to a previous episode return of the swamp thing Uh uh-huh does a better job of explaining its creatures that come out of nonsense science weekend at birdies 2 did a better job of explaining how this guy danced around to hypnotic caribbean island music than this movie does that i will have to take your word for i I have never seen weekend at birdies 2 a problem that will soon be remedied (laughs) oh no there are times when we're doing this show that i say something i realize immediately it was a mistake like when i was like faust what's faust you know this is still better than faust love of the day because it's shorter and also it doesn't like curl your soul that's absolutely true so not rosie perez is decorating a cake as not nev campbell is like that's it Uh uh-huh little leaves that looks good i'm sorry i was short with you earlier look at me i'm making these flowers does my accent sound believable do i sound hispanic do you think it would be wrong if i said i i i a lot on delay on delay okay all right i won't do that then outside they hear kaboom kaboom Oh my God, Bo. It's the greatest moment of this movie. The best character of the movie for sure. She should be in it more than Gary Busey. Yes. It's Betty, the mother and owner of the bakery, the the titular Betty of Betty's Bakery. Uh Uh-huh. She got a shotgun in one hand Uh and a bottle of Jack Daniels in the other. And she is the drunk we were promised earlier in this movie. Yeah. Chekhov's drunk has now made an appearance. And she is (laughs) shooting the banner off of the building across the street well the booze calms her nerves (laughs) she's a crack shot 
Yeah, it certainly improves her aim. Did you see the banner? It says, coming soon, across the street, bakery and cafe. That's a good name for a bakery that's across the street from Betty's Bakery. They couldn't get city council to approve Fuck Betty's Bakery as the name of their establishment. Not Betty's Bakery. Betty's Bakery has AIDS. Like, oh, what? Betty's Bakery, comma, two, T-O-O. Like, how do we get higher in the yellow pages? What if we call it A Betty's Bakery? BB Betty's Bakery? Triple B Betty's Bakery? Higher in the search results, the SEO is off the charts. I know Gary Busey, and he said that he will do a commercial for this pretending that he's Max Headroom with a little bu- 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 Betty's Bakery. Holy shit. Hey, stop in for some m- 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 muffins. Mom sits down her bottle of whiskey for just a moment, and she screams out, Those bastards think they're gonna get the best of me! Whoa! What's the middle of the night in small town, <laughs> maybe Waco, Texas? This is getting good. Also, anytime you're just randomly shooting in Waco, Texas, the one thing you're guaranteed is the ATF is gonna give you a wide berth. They don't want to get sucked into that quagmire. Again. Yeah, or an award. <laughs> right there's a drunk woman shooting down on main street has she set anything on fire not yet call us when she does and we'll do nothing so not nev campbell tells mm-hmm. not rosie perez like you gotta take betty home look you've had too much to drink you need to go home okay missy's mom in the movie and then the mother tells her oh you're looking to get fired girl you should be lucky i gave you a job in the first place coming across the border taking all the jobs of the good white people that don't want to work build that wall build that wall betty upset about this chain bakery or Them whatever sons of bitches think they can move in here and take over and run out what chance do we have against a statewide chain? Not Nev Campbell, my daughter. <laughs> this presumes then that there is a chain of bakeries called Across the Street Bakeries. It's kind of like CVS always building across from Walgreens. Mm. They just go find an established bakery. They come in. They undercut their prices by 15 to 20 percent. They run them out of business. Yeah, it's good business. Good business. I can't argue with the business model. I, just, I can't do it. Julia, a.k.a. not Rosie Perez, is like, I'm going to take this bendejo bow back and make her take a nap. I'll come back to help later. We call it a wild turkey nap. It's like a cat <laughs> nap, but it's more like passing out because, you know, glug glug nap in quotes aka sleeping it off it's the middle of the night and you're drunk shooting a firearm you're not gonna go take a nap unless there's gonna be more drinking and gun shooting oh well once the methamphetamines kick in i'll be ready to go (laughs) back inside the bakery not freddie prince jr stops the dough as it's mixing around and then he walks off and we get a close-up shot of the dough where a tiny hand rises up out of the mixture and it may or may not be giving us the audience the middle finger that's kind of what it looked like but again because nothing in this movie is very good it's hard to tell uh uh-uh. then it just sinks back down bloop 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 back outside the bakery it's nighttime keep that in mind Mm -hmm. Uh, A black sports car pulls up and this older redheaded gentle being gets out the aforementioned Larry Cedar. He plays a character named Jimmy Dean because the screenwriters were not very good at anything. It's hard to argue. (laughs) He gets out of the sports car and he says, Yeehaw! Look at here, girl. What in tarnation did you do to my plastic bakery sign that cost me $8 and a coupon to make? You know what? I'm going to drive you and your drunk mama out of business because I'm the sole proprietor of this big fancy city fied restaurant bakery chain that's going to put you out of business. Yeehaw! And not Nev Campbell is like, look, I'm real sorry about what happened here. Mm -hmm, So how about I pay for the banner? And then why don't you just tell me what you want? Yeehaw. I really like a girl that gets down to business. Yeehaw. Here's the deal. A year from now, this here place is going to be up and running. The finest eatery in four counties. Yeehaw. Wait, a year from now? You don't put up a coming soon sign a year out of your opening date. You do that, what, maybe three months out and that's pushing it. And who calls it an eatery, Bo? Uh, Yeah, if he's doing, like, a blueberry muffin reduction, you call it an eatery. (laughs) Also, if you want to know what Larry Cedar looks like, he's like a Daniel Stern shrinky dink. (laughs) <laughs> or he could be the bad guy in the ghostbusters reboot Ugh, yeah so not lizzie mcguire his daughter in the car uh-huh 
leans out and is like, I wouldn't give her $50,000, but that money goes a long way at Walmart. Mm-hmm. I'm the bitchy blonde in our movie. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say shit that's going to piss everybody off. Mm-hmm. Chewing gum, because mm-hmm, I'm a bitch. And Jimmy Dean is like, yeehaw, she was just named Miss Pretty Face Awako. That's not a contest, Bo. Jimmy yeah. Dean made it up and just awarded it to his daughter. It's like best bed maker in the house or clean dinner plate contest winner. Outstanding achievement in the field of excellence kind of thing. <laughs> Jimmy Dean says, yeehaw, you should take this $50,000 and make it so you and your drunk mama don't have to bust your humps working so hard. Yeehaw, 50 grand? That's not life-changing money, Bo, for two people. You know, and plus, didn't they get some scratch from the death of the dad and the brother, like life insurance or maybe a lawsuit against Cadillac Jacks and the Pink Motel? They had to have some kind of insurance in case Gary Busey came in, started shooting everybody. In this movie was made pre-financial collapse so 50 grand is not gonna touch the real estate alone that the building sits on no even in waco texas but then again betty is pretty drunk so she probably makes a lot of crazy decisions (laughs) not nev campbell looks at jimmy dean and she says you know what you can just pardon my french stick that offer in your ear jimmy dean and she turns around and goes back inside betty's bakery and she goes behind the sales counter of the bakery which by the way bo has way too much product on the shelves and in the display case there are perishable goods everywhere i get that inventory management in a bakery has got to be a real challenge but to have hundreds of cookies and pastries and loaves of bread just lying around people don't want day old bread they want day of bread unless you're looking for croutons which is the day oldest of breads but then again (laughs) you would just be making a crouton store that's a good idea Uh croutons 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 betty's croutons mine is called on top of salad Mm, that's a pretty good one yeah i would call it stale squares Mm, that's not bad Mm, it's not good either the upper crust Eh, let me think on that one we'll have to workshop it some not freddie prince jr he walks into the front of the bakery and he says oh yeah i was eavesdropping on your drunk mom and jimmy deed outside offering you fifty thousand dollars that guy's a jerk and his daughter not lizzie mcguire she's a jerk too if I had half a mind, I'd put him in a Texas Twister from the top rope, take him both down with a butterfly swoop. Oh, yeah! Not Nev Campbell, just kind of pats his shoulder and is like, I really like all your wrestling metaphors, but I'm having a real crisis of faith about this business right now. I appreciate you giving me a pep talk and all, but sales are down and Betty's drinking. I mean, more so. And everything's so messed up. I just don't even know where to start, how to fix this place. This whole scene feels like it should be on an episode of Felicity or One Tree Hill. Not in a movie about a murdering gingerbread man. Because she goes on and on about the death of her brother and how her family's legacy is coming to a grinding halt. And in the background you hear, I don't want to wait for our lives to be over. Not Freddie Prince Jr. says, oh yeah, uh, you just had a couple of bad years, that's all. That's how you console her? A couple of bad years? I've had my share of difficulties in life, Chad. Uh Uh-huh. But I don't know that I've ever said, you know, those were a couple of bad years. You know, you try to divvy that up into months or, you know, for convenience's sake, decades. I think it started with the death of your father and brother. Oh, yeah. Say, you want to go to Russellpalooza with me? Oh, yeah. And not Neff Campbell looks at this idiot and she's like, hmm, and says nothing. And he's just like, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm going to go make some cookies. Oh, yeah. She shuts him down so hard. It is the most emasculating moment of this movie. Like you said, she doesn't even say a word, Chad. It's just uh-huh. a look that says, like, I think you and I both know that's never going to happen. And this is as close as you and I are ever going to be, just friends. So I'd appreciate it if, one, you got out of here and went to your wrestling thing. And, two, you stopped looking at my ass because that ain't ever going to happen. <laughs> she actually goes so far to say, like, why don't you just take the knife? off and go you know do whatever it is you do when you're not here and he does he leaves the movie pretty much for the majority of the film not to return until the last like three minutes of the film spoilers our wrestling jackass is going to show up at the very end fortunately that's only 30 minutes from now not nev campbell rolls out the gingerbread dough and she uses this press to make a gingerbread man that is well over two feet tall which one, who would purchase this product at a bakery? <laughs> this is a novelty gingerbread man, yes. 
too. Gingerbread cookies are gross. I don't. If you're looking at for an argument out of me, you you got it wrong. I'm a Samoa's man myself. <laughs> They're nasty. No one's gonna buy this. So she pops this one and only gingerbread man into the oven. Which why would she only make one of these? She has all of this dough. Maybe she's lazy because this place is clearly not concerned about supply meeting demand of the products they offer for sale. There are a couple of ways that you could have done this, Chad. You could have had it so that she's making this big special gingerbread man to put in the window to draw people in. Uh, surrounded by Christmas lights and set the movie at Christmas. Sure. The other thing is she could have had a semi-smaller gingerbread man and not use the middle of the dough and pressed it out like an actual baker where you're trying to get as many cookies out of this roll of dough that you can. Regardless, she does it in a way that suggests, like we said before, nobody cared about this movie. Nobody was like, hey, you're doing it wrong if you're a ba- You know what? Never mind. Just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, speaking of doing it wrong, she definitely decorates the gingerbread man before she bakes it she puts like gumdrops and cookies and eyeballs and shit on it and like frosting and like a a price tag and then she pops it in the oven idiot i like that this is a real like hey fat ass version of the gingerbread man of like not only is it a cookie by itself but how about a little sprinkle of gummy bears on top you know (laughs) just to add a few calories that one's for Andy. Once our gingerbread man is in the oven, it starts baking and we see that it has this face that's all puckered and sinister. It looks like it was snatched off the cover of the Necronomicon. The Necronomicon. Huh? <laughs> the Necronomicon. Right? So she throws this into the weirdest oven I've ever seen in my life. I looked up whether or not there is a real thing like a walk-in oven and what I found was a bunch of Holocaust images, which I immediately shut that down i don't know that this is a real real thing i don't think it is because uh, you you and i both worked in and around restaurants to some degree (laughs) for large portions of our lives right and i felt like we would have heard about this i think in industrial bakeries that it maybe is a thing but it seems highly suspect but anyway she goes into this walk-in oven leaves our gingerbread man and he gets baked up not neff campbell then goes back to the front of the house of the bakery and not lizzie mcguire the bitch of the movie she's there walking around and not nev campbell says what are you doing here in my store at night this is breaking and entering oh my god is that a rat you know what get it away from all of our baked goods they're stale and crusty i don't want it to somehow open the packaging and let some sort of freshness back in and then not lizzie mcguire says i just figured that you were here on friday night because you're a loser and i didn't bring that rat in here your bakery's gross you're gross i told my dad that giving you fifty thousand dollars is way too much money for you and your drunk mom because she's just going to drink it all and then y'all will be broke again which is hilarious okay and did you hear me make that comment earlier about how much you can buy at walmart that was directed at you because you're poor and not nev campbell fed up with this girl breaking in and dropping rodents in her business Uh uh-huh gives her an old-fashioned pie to the face apparently this is a slapstick comedy now it becomes a, a real battle of these two girls going from the lobby to the back of this industrial bakery which Uh sounds more exciting than it is because it's really them just grabbing each other and kind of half-ass slap fighting until they get to the back where the director was like i need you here in front of the camera right crash into an electrical box in the back of the bakery Mm -hmm. which sparks something and then electricity runs down i don't know like a tesla coil or something Mm -hmm. and it's reminiscent of dr frankenstein's monster and then it electrocutes the oven and the two foot tall gingerbread man creature kind of explodes and crackles and comes to life and you hear the voice of gary Busey laugh and go all right so am i doing uh uh, like an evil voice now is that what's happening here hey everybody it's me ginger dead man i'm gonna be hanging out for the rest of the movie but me gary Busey, is not in it anymore i'm just gonna be here on my toilet did you really think this was gary Busey doing the voice of the puppet because it doesn't sound like him a lot of the time it's hard to tell because i think you're right i don't think it's him all the time but he's also credited as the voice of the ginger dead man I think they used some audio of him and puppeted the mouth to say that. I truly believe that it was Dennis doing his impression of whoever, Ray Stance or Pope John Paul or something. And then they like they just faked it the rest of the way through. Very possible. Gave that guy a couple of coupons and off he went. It's tough to say. And then in comes not Matthew Lillard. 
the final new character to our movie. Yes. And Bo, he is wearing a sleeveless t-shirt with what appears to be an illustration from a some e-card with this 50 style image of a white man pointing his hand and accompanied are the words, pull my finger. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's maybe my favorite thing in the movie. Aside from Is Betty, pull my finger still a thing? It's got to be, right? I say it to almost everyone I meet. We don't do pull my finger in my house. The running gag we have that replaced that is whenever someone asks, what's that smell? The answer is always, I just farted. <laughs> so the direct approach? Well, you're doing a dipsy doodle. Like if my wife is baking cookies and someone comes in, it's like, what's that smell? Oh, I just farted. Good, bad, or indifferent. There's always someone smelling something in my house. And I'm taking credit with my farts. Here's my go-to old man joke about farting. Okay. It's when you hear a loud car or uh -huh. a muffler or something, uh -huh. then I'll look at whoever I'm with and I'll say, oh, pardon me. Oh, that's a pretty good one. Yeah. I'll also add, when I hear loud cars driving by, I hate the people who are driving them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, those people are assholes. No getting around that. Who do people hate more? Mm -hmm. People that ride expensive, fancy bikes on the road where cars belong Oof. and not assholes on fancy bikes, or people that go to Subway and order more than three sandwiches at once. Oh, it's guys on bikes, the, the old Carlin chestnut of put your toys back in your yard. It's that. <laughs> like, I don't go to Subway nearly enough for the three subs plus thing to be a bother, but I am constantly bothered by jerks who are riding their $3,000 10 speed mm -hmm. in the middle of the road with their fancy bike pants and little helmet. Is it better or worse when they're in a gaggle of bikes? Like one guy on his bike, like, look at this asshole. But when you get like 12 or 15 of them. I mean, it's more convenient because you can get them off the road that much quicker and into traction. <laughs> When I hear about people crashing into a bunch of people on bikes, I'm like, that all makes sense. I'm sure you know this, but I hit a guy on a bike. What? Yeah. I didn't hear this story when? Oh, Recently? this is years ago. No, no, no. It's been a while This is ago. how I know what you did last summer started. There did you kill was, him? No, I didn't Do kill him. Do you need a shovel? <laughs> no. He's fine now, I assume. Was it Stephen King? It was. I was drunkenly driving a van. <laughs> no, I was pulling into Centennial Park in Nashville. You were pulling into a guy on a bike. <laughs> well, that's how it turned out. It was one of those merge lanes, you know? So I stopped my car to check over my left shoulder to see if any cars are coming. Uh -huh. And there aren't. Right. And so I start to move forward again. And uh -huh. then when I look back Some at my asshole. Hood, yeah, there's a dude on a bike on the hood of my car at that point. Taking a nap. I wish. Bleeding from his ear and the side of his mouth. He was doing a real NBA flop. You know, <laughs> it's the old joke of like, I hit him when I was doing two miles an hour, but I was at two. I wasn't like getting to two miles an hour. I was at two. <laughs> <laughs> did he sue you he come after you no he didn't sue me but like we had to trade insurance information and that kind uh -huh. of thing and he got a couple of doctor visits out of me and my insurance went up seven bucks a month for about two years what a dickhead and the thing is when i got questioned <laughs> by the police about this because the police showed up right the police were like so how did this happen and i was like well here's what i think happened uh -huh. which is he was cutting across the road shithead because i looked behind me and there was he wasn't coming from behind me so i start easing forward and then he's on my hood so he had to either come across the front of my car from the right or the left uh -huh. while i was looking behind me right <laughs> and they were like well can you swear to that i was like no because the first time i saw him was when he was on my windshield he was screaming i'm gonna die i saw his tibia poking my windshield wiper i mean he was ultimately fine and everything right. but it was it made me resent bicyclists even more than i already did but so whenever somebody is like oh you know these stupid bicyclists i'm the one person that can raise their hand and be like yeah i hit one of those fuckers hmm. i did my part what are you doing to get him off the road Officer, did I mention he's fucking my wife? I, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that. Just scratch that. Did I tell you that we were in business together for a short time and <laughs> it ended badly? And then now it's ended worse. Also, he put out an insurance policy on me. You know what he told me as soon as he hit the, the hood of my car? Blue lives don't matter. That's what he said. I'll swear to that.
Son of a bitch. But yeah, so I've tried to do my part for getting bicycles off the road is the point of all of that. <laughs> so not Matthew Lillard is wearing a shirt that says, pull my finger. He's also wearing these Kevin Smith style shorts that go all the way down to the bottom of his calves. And he's got Doc Martin black boots. It's a real 90s outfit. He could have been one of the members of the gang in Return of the Living Dead. Maybe <laughs> not so far as trash, but he could have been in that gang. He's, you know, he's got the hoop in his, like, right eyebrow. Yeah. Definitely. And, it, like, Jimmy Dean refers to him as that tatted up punk at one point. Although we don't see any tattoos on him, I don't think. Well, the screenwriters were doing one thing. The movie was doing something else. <laughs> not Matthew Lillard says, hi, not Lizzie McGuire. Look, I've been waiting in this car over here forever. Where have you been? And not Lizzie McGuire says, um, we got into a big pie fight and then I got whipped cream and marzipan all over my face and in my hair, but you wouldn't know it because the movie doesn't pay attention to any of the details. And I'm this pretty face Waco or whatever. It's all an oversight. Nobody gives a shit about anything around here. And <laughs> not Nev Campbell is like, and I bet you were here to drop off more rats or something. You dumb old, not Matthew Lillard. And he's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Are you saying there's rats in here? Cause that ain't cool. That's how the black death spread through europe now that was one of the most devastating things that ever happened in the history of mankind i was on the internet the other night and they said the only thing that could possibly be worse than that is bats from china i'm not dealing with rats i'm not dealing with bats the only thing i'm dealing with is cats because i love garfield i gotta be honest with you i mostly love lasagna but by association i really like garfield because he's yeah. almost as big a fan well every time he's like i love lasagna i'm like i get it brother i know what you're talking about i love lasagna too i even like that vegetarian lasagna it's almost as good as the meat kind i mean that's my favorite but i like them both also hate mondays who doesn't? Anyway, what's going on in this oven over here? Out comes the ginger dead man. Before they open the door, the ginger dead man peeks through the window and he gives out this. <laughs> and then they open it up and he runs, runs as fast as he can and they can't catch him because he's a ginger dead man. Yeah. He yells, it sure ain't the Pillsbury fucking dough boy. Yeah, he says that. And then runs off. And not Nev Campbell is like, do y'all recognize his voice? It sounds familiar to me. Let me recollect for a moment. <laughs> It sounds like Gary Busey, but kind of not. Like somebody doing a bad impression, maybe from a shitty podcast or something. Do y'all hear that? And then she says, y'all, I was making a gingerbread man. I think maybe that had something to do with it. Wait, you were making a gingerbread man and you think that's what's running around here? Look, this is a gag, all right? I'll bet it's that geek who works for you who's all into wrestling. And not Lizzie McGuire is like... You guys, it was alive. It was black magic. Let me tell you this story. One time I was using a Ouija board and there was this girl that I contacted from the other side. <laughs> and she said she got cut up into little pieces and wrapped in aluminum foil and mailed all over the country. And you guys, you're not going to believe this. A couple of days later, I saw on the news where they said that a bunch of people had received packages in the mail that were relatives of theirs that had been cut up and sent to them. In response to this story. Yeah. Yes. Not Matthew Lillard says, go oh, on, talk about going postal. And then he accidentally says something funny in this movie when he says the Ouija board spelled all that out for you. That's longer than any book you ever read in your life, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? You're right. I don't like to read too much on account of it gives my eyes wrinkles when I have to squint to read. So I'm trying to stay pretty. You're welcome. Not Nev Campbell says, not Lizzie McGuire is right. We should leave this place. Which, Bo, why don't they leave the bakery in this movie when things start getting weird? They are not trapped here. There's about seven different times in this movie where they should, by all reason, walk out the door and call the police. Some of them do. Some of them walk outside and then just do -si do back in. And there's always one of those moments where one of them says something like, you know, we just can't leave Julia here, or we can't leave Betty, or I'm going to finish this once and for all. And you're like, why? Get out of there. Get help. You're dealing with dark magic. <laughs> Not Matthew Lillard, ever the voice of reason. In our movie says, look, y'all, this is a gag, all right? And I'm going to beat the shit out of whoever's doing this. But if this is a real talking gingerbread man, we could put this thing on Jay Leno or David Letterman or maybe Charlie Rose if he's real smart. Chevy Chase, I think he's still got a talk show. Or Dennis Miller. Is Arsenio on the air? What year is it exactly? So, Chad, our trio of dum-dums goes... <laughs> 
hunting for this ginger dead man. But they've not even seen it yet. They're just, all right, go on, sorry. Who is eating like a fucking gremlin Uh in some walk-in fridge where it's just like, and like half gallons of milk are flying out of this. Yeah, we don't see him though. No. And so they shut the door to trap him inside, but he got out, I guess? Sure. And so the search is back on, because that scene was meaningless, but we got 54 minutes to fill. (laughs) And so we go to the lobby, our other set... (laughs) <laughs> and not nev campbell tries to call the police but the line is dead uh-huh and then not lizzie mcguire tries to call her father uh-huh and gets as far as hey daddy guess what there's a, a gingerbread man on the loose trying to kill us <laughs> and we got homicidal baked goods on our trail <laughs> and then her her father rightly just hangs up on her and her, well, her phone goes dead because she didn't charge it that's what she says <laughs> I think that it's Jimmy Dean being like, oh, Lord, not again. She got with that not Matthew Lillard fella doing them psychedelic drugs. Oh, my God. So we cut to the back of the house of this bakery where drunk mom shows up for a reason I can't explain. She walks (laughs) in and she says, what the hell is happening in here? Which is her catchphrase when entering any Roomba. Or waking up coming to yeah she gets spooked by the rat that not lizzie mcguire brought Uh uh-huh and then she's like fuck you stupid rat hang on a second i got a little something for you and then reaches into a bowl or something where she has stashed a bottle of george dickel and or jack daniels and it's not like a personal size it's party size it it might be a handle it's personal (laughs) sized if you're well on the way to death and she hears the ginger dead man giggling somewhere <laughs> and is drunk enough to just go wandering in that direction. Who's there? Who's this? Ah. You got any RC cola to mix with? Because it tastes so sweet that way. She takes a slug off this bottle of hooch. And the music here is very playful. It's the kind of music you hear in Home Alone preceding the springing of a classic Kevin McAllister booby trap. I would go so far as to call it a very nutty christmas-esque yeah it's like you know bing, bing, ding, 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 ding. drunk mom walks over to the vision board that her daughter has made and she sees the two newspaper clippings that are all ripped up about gary Busey, and she says it can't be him why would this drunk woman staggering around the back of her own bakery hearing a random sound think that it is the man who murdered her husband and son who was executed two or three three days ago she's drinking an industrial sized bottle of brown liquor chad she believes anything at this point i have done the exact same thing numerous times and i've never been in a state of mind where i would go down this particular path i got so drunk on white russians that for a while i was q what are you doing drinking cream with liquor that's your first mistake i'm an old man i can only have liquor if it tastes kind of like candy i can only have dairy if it has liquor in it (laughs) i'm on nothing these days but grasshoppers and mudslides shed that's all i can drink i'll have 12 slippery nipples please yeah in one glass thank you (laughs) two straws i'm on a date with the lord (laughs) the ginger dead man appears and we see the audience that he's got a knife hidden behind his back it's a tiny knife yes (laughs) and betsy kind of approaches like what the hell is that it's a sentient pastry starts creeping up but again she's so drunk that this is either a hallucination or tuesday she reaches out for like i can't tickle your little belly gingerbread man and (laughs) Gary Busey <laughs> says, ever try a lady finger? And then whips this knife out, cutting off one of her fingers. Uh-huh. And because her blood has been so thinned by alcohol, yeah. Betty just passes out. So she's down. She's not going to have a stroke. There's no way that blood's clotting ever. She might cry blood to death, <laughs> but she's never going to have a massive a coronary up front in the bakery you know Bo. on the other side of that wall our trio of dummies they hear the scream but they don't do anything about it not matthew lillard says hey y'all i'm gonna just head on out to the car and get a different phone or maybe a charger or smoke a joint or something i don't I'll, i'm going outside and not lizzie mcguire is like I think that ginger dead man recognized you, not Nev Campbell. Maybe you two are in cahoots or something. 
We cut back to the nine-fingered drunk mom laying on her back in a pile of laundry, I think. And the ginger dead man approaches and he says, You should stop drinking, you lush. Do you recognize my pretty voice? It's me, Gary Busey from earlier in the movie. And then the ginger dead man hears something and he runs off as fast as he can. Because not Rosie Perez has come back in and she's like, Betty, what are you doing in that laundry cart or whatever? And <laughs> Betty is like, you're not going to believe this. That killer who killed my husband's son, he's a ginger dead man mm -hmm. now. Yes, yes. And I think he's probably going to try to kill all of us. Also, have you seen a bottle with the black label on it? I've seen a lot of bottles of black labels, Betty. You've told me this story many times before. Let's get you up and put your hand above your heart so we'll make the bleeding bleed less and we will try to get you better. Let's go to a different corner of the back of house because no one's going to see us for a while. But before she can do that, the ginger dead man reappears with a pan or something. Uh-huh. Clunk. Yeah, it just clunks her on the head like Mo. Yeah. And says, ha, that's going to leave a mark. Out in the car, not Matthew Lillard. He's rooting around looking for a cell phone or a charger or a joint. And instead, Bo, he finds a pistol and just tucks it in the back of his pants. Yeah, I also like that this scene lets us know he's got a chain wallet, which also means that there's a Sugar Ray CD <laughs> floating around in that car somewhere. <laughs> back inside, not now. F. Campbell and not Lizzie McGuire. They chatted up as not Matthew Lillard returns with his gun. The ginger dead man then goes and turns the power off to the bakery so everything goes black. Cut to outside the bakery where all of the lights are still on inside the bakery because <laughs> yeah. nothing in this movie matters. And Jimmy Dean has pulled up in his fancy car uh -huh. and he's already just being a pill. Uh -huh. where he's like, that girl's here with that stupid tatted up Amos. When I get my hands on him i'm gonna ground them both i'm gonna yeah. snatch them both bald-headed yeehaw I'm, I'm gonna tan their hides or some other southern colloquialism yeehaw and inside we get a touching moment between not nev campbell and not matthew lillard for no reason do, where do, 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 you know do, do, do. i j i want you to put that gun away because that really scares me a little bit. And also, I just want you to know, you don't scare me that much. You and me, we know each other. And you don't know I know you. But one time, I had a birthday party when I was six years old. And you came to it. And you were flirting with me. And then you tried to kiss me. And then I punched you in the face because I'm a little bit of a psychopath. And all that's to say that you're not as tough as you think you are. Because then you cried. And not Matthew Lillard is like, <laughs> I guess, you know, sometimes I just get turned on when girls hit me. You mind yeah. kicking me in the balls? I'm just with, with not Lizzie McGuire because she's rich and she pays for all the beer and pizza. And she's also into cock and ball torture. <laughs> she shares a sweet childhood moment and he starts talking about sadomasochistic sex. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't want to win outside jimmy dean he gets out of his black sports car and then the ginger dead man hops into the car and using a rolling pin to reach the gas pedal he makes the car rush forward and crushes jimmy dean against a wall not since short round have we seen such an innovative <laughs> way to propel a car why did the ginger dead man kill jimmy dean He's a psychopath, Chad. He's killing everybody. <laughs> Not Lizzie McGuire. She's hanging out in the bakery, just walking back and forth with a rolling pin in her hand. This is her weapon of choice. And not Matthew Lillard, not Neff Campbell. They come out after not fixing this generator. Why would a bakery have a generator? You know what? I'm just going to stop. So, Because <laughs> <laughs> it was in the script, Chad. <laughs> the girls get into a shouting match until not Matthew Lillard notices a trail of blood on the floor that leads to a walk-in cooler. They open the cooler, and who do they find inside, Bo? not rosie perez lying on the floor of this cooler with her whole body covered in whipped cream from her neck to her toes and she is playfully decorated with sprinkles and two large cherries on top of her breasts to replicate nipples oh is that what it was supposed to be they drag her out and they're like i don't know y'all i guess we just throw a blanket on her or something do you have a hose 
you got a Labrador, maybe a Golden Retriever, just come here and lick her clean. And not Neff Campbell is like, wait a second, you guys, I think I totally know who this ginger dead man is now. I think it's the man who killed my father and brother and made my mother an alcoholic. She was an alcoholic before her husband and kid were killed. Yeah, why do you think they were at that diner? The <laughs> husband was like, look, kids, I think we're going to leave. We're going to California. <laughs> right. We're going to leave your mother to her failing business and her failing liver. <laughs> These are your new identities. When I put my foot on yours <laughs> and call you not Jennifer Love Hewitt, that is going to be your new identity. <laughs> Speaking of, not Lizzie McGuire goes outside to find her father crushed by a car. Oh my God, Daddy! Daddy, no, you can't be dead. You mean the world to me. Wait a minute, what's this ring on your finger? Daddy, I'm going to miss you. Bye, Daddy. Yeah, she just like loots the body of her old man. Uh huh. And then back inside, not Nev Campbell is convincing not Matthew Lillard that the ginger dead man is in fact gary Busey, and then she goes on to say i don't think we have to worry too much about julia i think she's gonna be okay she's just in shock right now and not matthew lillard's like whoa listen to the smarty pants here how would you even know that well you know i've been taking some night classes what what kind of night classes are you taking well you know in nursing it's just at the community college it, it's not that big a deal I think it's a very big deal. You help people. You're special, not Nev Campbell. Me? And then they kiss and make out a little. It's ridiculous. It doesn't belong in this movie. No, but I, I love it for the show. So not Lizzie McGuire storms back into the bakery with her newfound loot uh -huh. where the ginger dead man is waiting for her in the lobby. Uh -huh. And he says, how about a facial? And slashes her face with a knife. Mm -hmm. Miss Pretty Face Waco no more. Good luck repeating that when a second time in a row, not Lizzie McGuire. And she screams and runs to the other set. She's like... <laughs> Oh my God, y'all, he killed my father. We get a scene with the ginger dead man looking over at the rat from earlier, and he picks a fight with this animal. Hey, rat, look over here. You want a piece of me? I'm going to kick your rat ass. Which I would like to see the ginger dead man fight a rat. Would you like to see the ginger dead man fight an evil bong? Because that's a movie. I know. I'm not watching that. So not Lizzie McGuire is really upset about her cut face on account of her being Miss Pretty Face Waco or whatever. And she says... <laughs> That's it. I'm leaving. Finally. Uh -huh. And she starts to walk out, but hits some kind of tripwire booby trap that the ginger dead man has set up uh, that propels uh, a knife into her forehead. Right. While Gary Busey is cackles in the background. <laughs> Not Matthew Lillard says, oh shit, he's booby trapped all the exits, like the one in the back. And apparently not the front door, because I just went out that, and considering she just set off the booby trap, we could probably just go out the back door now. I doubt it's double booby trap, but you can't be too sure. Not Nev Campbell does a total I know what you did last summer here. If you hadn't made the joke earlier, I got a not Jennifer Love Hubert comment here, but <laughs> please continue. <laughs> Where it's her, like, doing the full arm spread. Uh -huh. Come and get me, y'all. Come on. <laughs> and Ginger Dead Man says, Hey, your old man and your brother were stupid back at the diner. They tried to stop me, but you didn't because you were afraid and you were a scaredy cat. I'm like, wait, so you're picking on her because she was afraid and didn't come after you, but then the bravery of her dad and her brother got them killed. Which, what? Well, he's a psychopath, Chad. Oh, yeah. Mixed messages are kind of what he does. <laughs> it's real cerebral. It's a real silence of the gingerbread here. So, not <laughs> Nev Campbell. Do you still hear the gingerbread screen? And so not Matthew Lillard and not Nev Campbell find Betty's finger. The severed finger. Yeah. And not Matthew Lillard's like, whoa, wait a second. I'm having a thought. This finger is pointing at something because that's what fingers do. <laughs> <laughs> they realize that it's pointing at the oven this ridiculous walk-in oven of theirs <laughs> and they struggle to get it open because you know we need this thing to be 54 minutes before credits right and so we need to take a good solid minute to get this thing open where they find betty inside who's uh -huh. alive but kind of crispy she's just sleeping it off you know this isn't the first time they found her passed out in the oven i'm sure no 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 so not matthew lillard drags her out but while he's doing that, Gary Busey slips in and 
closes the oven, locking not Nev Campbell inside the oven, and then he gets a hammer uh-huh. and clunks not Matthew Lillard in the head to knock him out. Yep. So it looks like the day is won by the ginger dead man who is now burning alive his nemesis, this woman who he didn't shoot at a diner once. In California? Yeah, but not Matthew Lillard recovers just in time. You mean immediately? <laughs> right. To <laughs> shoot the oven doors lock off thereby allowing not nev campbell to escape but somehow or another gary Busey gets the gun away yeah that was just in the other guy's hand that's right and he's pointing the gun at our two remaining characters in the movie sort of don't worry everybody comes back in just a moment i think you mean three remaining characters well i don't know that drunk betty is alive or not oh, oh drunk, drunk betty, betty. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Struck in the oven again. Bam, bam, bam. So the ginger dead man says, hey, it's all over but the crime. And then out of nowhere, Bo, not Freddie Prince Jr. jumps back into the movie and the ginger dead man screams, what the fuck? That's pretty good. That made me laugh. Got to admit. <laughs> And the ginger dead man just starts firing randomly at everyone and Uh hits no one. Real quick, time check. Six minutes left in this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're almost done here, folks. And then not Rosie Perez shows up as well. She's Uh come to, which just goes to show that maybe not Nev Campbell, not the nurse she thinks she is. But not (laughs) Rosie Perez takes a pan and smacks Gary Busey with it. Uh Uh-huh. And then not Freddie Prince Jr. just grabs this ginger dead man and starts eating him. Yeah. And he's got like little human intestines and whatnot. It looks like somebody gutted a squirrel. (laughs) I took the more pleasant route. I thought he was maybe full of strawberry jam. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, if you want to play it naive, Chad. Not Freddie Prince Jr. finishes consuming the head and upper torso of the ginger dead man, and he lets out a belch and goes, Oh, yeah, got milk? Oh. Ugh, man, that's the thing that'll make you just want to turn this right off is the got milk line. It, it is a failed attempt at humor, which this movie is glaringly absent any jokes or humor. It feels like it should be riddled with crypt keeper puns to accompany the death scenes. And there are a couple of bad plays on words, but they don't do it as much as they should have. And also at this point in the film, there's only two dead people in this movie, Jimmy Dean and not Liz mcguire yeah it's a pitiful body count to be sure and the second one was killed by a booby trap not actually killed by the ginger dead man proper so chad we (sighs) overhear gary Busey say save room for dessert because i'm coming back for you (laughs) not freddie prince jr's guzzling half a gallon of milk chug 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 and not rosie perez says wow now we know who is muy macho eh the butcher baker she's clearly horned up by his eating of a semi-sentient bean (laughs) betty comes to Uh uh-huh drunk mom hey wait a second what's going on here who's eating all our product put that out somebody could buy that Not Freddie Prince Jr. is having stomach cramps and he goes over to the sink. He washes his face and looks in the mirror and he says, oh, it's not over, girl. It's not over by a long shot. Implying that the spirit of Gary Busey is now inside not Freddie Prince Jr.'s body. Time check. Three minutes left in our movie, Bo. And then everyone is heading outside. Uh Uh-huh. They're taking drunk mom to the hospital or maybe an AA meeting. Once she gets to the hospital, there's going to be some pamphlets left by the medical staff, I'm sure. (laughs) Not Nev Campbell is like, oh, wait a second, y'all. I got to go back inside for no good reason. Oh, wait, to get that other guy that showed up at the end of the movie and was at the beginning and I kind of forgot he was in it. And she goes back inside, but not Freddie Prince Jr. is now all zombied out. Yeah. And kind of grabs her and is like, oh, yeah, I'm possessed by Gary Busey. I'm going to lick you with my gross blue tongue. (laughs) Outside, everybody hears the screams from inside the bakery. So not Matthew Lillard rushes back in to see what all the hubbub is about. Once inside, not Matthew Lillard instinctively knows that not Freddie Prince Jr., who is dressed up in some backyard extreme wrestling gear. He now has the possessed spirit of Gary Busey inside him. And then these two just 
just start slapping each other a couple of times. And then not Matthew Lillard pushes him back and unceremoniously unloads the rest of his gun into this guy. Yep. But it doesn't kill him because he's possessed by Gary Busey and we all know that Gary Busey can't be killed by mortal weapons. Not at all. Oh yeah, that ain't gonna kill me. <laughs> and so they just opened the, this walk-in oven which I think they shot the lock off of just a little while ago. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> but whatever. They shove him inside there and push it closed and maybe back a chair up to it or something to keep it that way. Put a phone book on top of it. Farewell to arms. <laughs> and th we see some smoke in the oven and not Freddie Prince Jr. screams. And then somehow not Rosie Perez has shown up also. Yeah. I guess to remind. So what is Betty? Are they letting her wander the streets out there? That doesn't seem wise. They gave her a gun and a bottle of hooch. She's fine. So that's it for the the bulk we have an epilogue yeah we fade out and fade in and there's a sidewalk sale going on outside the bakery there's a couple of nurses there so maybe not nev campbell went to nursing school and one of the nurses comments on how much better drunk mom looks now that she's sobered up for a weekend <laughs> that's my favorite oh look at betty she looks sober <laughs> Look at how wonderful she looks, not drunk. Not Matthew Lillard. He shows up to snuggle and kiss on not Neff Campbell. Then two boys walk over and say, hey, you got any gingerbread cookies? And then not Neff Campbell says, not if you're lucky. <laughs> and one of the nurses says, actually, a strange woman in a black cloak just came over and dropped off these cute little rascals. And they open the box and inside are five gingerbread men and their eyes transform from black dots to white dots with with smaller black dots on top of them so they look like more realistic eyes and the nurse who opened the box says couldn't you just die and then we fade to black the end it's not totally the end because we get some glamour shots of the cast doing what the cast did in the movie if you're nostalgic for what happened 53 minutes before the credits on this are insane in an hour and 10 minute movie the end credits are 10 minutes of that this movie like we said it's like 58 minutes minutes without credits with credits it's an hour 10 with credits okay and then in 58 without which makes it i believe the shortest film we've ever done yes i think it's the shortest film we've ever done with credits yeah it's a real something it's something all right it's not good <laughs> have you seen any of the subsequent entries into the ginger dead man canon of films oh and then no. there's the tommy chong bong thing you were talking about e yeah and... they're evil bong movies the, again this is all full moon features and no i have not seen it. she is in our our heroine in this movie is in evil bong 2 evil bong 3 she comes back for ginger dead man three and is also in the crossover uh ginger dead man versus evil ball so i think she is sort of the sarah connor <laughs> of the ginger dead man series but skips two like she's not in two so i don't i don't know what's going on there but there you have it hmm Okay. It's kind of like Sam Neill in those Jurassic Park movies. He did one, skips two, comes back for three, and then is reportedly going to show up for number six, if we're lucky. Yeah. I don't think you can say Jurassic Park six and lucky in the same sentence. This movie could have been much better it really felt like it wanted to be a child's play knockoff they just didn't include any of the gore or the campy humor or even just the logic of how he ended up as a ginger dead man that seems like real glaring omissions and it's really shocking that it is not set at christmas it should be yeah you're right the, the, that's really the frustrating thing i think about this movie in general is that even if you didn't really give a shit about this movie like it's already tongue-in-cheek but you could have fun with it if you just gave it a 10 percent more effort with script and production and all of that stuff of just like hey let's all have a good time with this instead of it just being the least effort you could possibly expend and still make a movie you know, Bo, over the last 100 plus episodes of this podcast, we have tackled a lot of terrible movies that mm -hmm. span a wide variety of genres from awful to unwatchable. Mm -hmm. But Bo, yes. there is one genre of film that we have never done. Oh, smell of vision Two genres of film we have never done. One of which is the romantic comedy. Oh. 
So on the second episode of this season, where we are taking on six Christmas-adjacent movies, I would like to propose that we tackle the film While You Were Sleeping, starring Sandra Bullock and the President of the United States from Independence Day, and the Grandpa from Everybody Loves Raymond, and the Bitchy Grandma from The Ref, which we referred to earlier and is an excellent movie, but While You Were Sleeping is not, and it is full of marginally recognized recognized people from other things you maybe have seen uh, let me ask one question about this is it yes. possible for me to get the gist of this movie while i am sleeping oh absolutely i'm all for it then sandra bullock plays a crazy woman in a holiday classic that involves all of the classic tropes that make a romantic comedy a romantic comedy so grab your tissues this one will tug at your heartstrings. i'm kidding it's terrible it's got sandra bullock <laughs> that used to mean something i don't know that it still does did it ever really? Mm, she was the daughter of the bionic woman and the $6 million man. She was also the blind side. And she was that blind lady riding around in a boat with her kids. Oh, yeah, that's true. That wasn't very good. Yeah, I think she had sex with Ryan Reynolds in a movie. She also <laughs> drove that boat in Speed 2. That was pretty good. Yeah, well, nobody's saying that she's not a good boat captain. Toot toot. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this episode of Pick 6 Movies featuring the ginger dead man. Bo, as always, any final thoughts on this Christmas-adjacent classic? It's not Christmas in the movie and it's not adjacent to being good it does have a gingerbread man and that is adjacent to christmas and christmas is all about someone being dead wait that's easter it is a holiday all about drinking and we do have an alcoholic in it it's christmas adjacent what can we say merry christmas everybody <laughs> welcome to season 18 